Hi, everyone. Very excited to be here today to share some work we've done at the University of Washington um, on a project called Aura. It's a six degree of freedom inside out electromagnetic tracking system for handheld VR controllers with head mounted displays. Now, before I begin, I want to recognize my collaborators, Farshid Slami Parisi and Shwedek Patel. New computing platforms, such as head mounted displays for virtual and augmented reality, have the potential to change the way we work, play, create, and communicate. As our computing devices evolve from 2D touchscreens to 3D computing environments, our input devices are also evolving to support spatial input. Today, the dominant input device for mixed reality systems is a positionally tracked controller. This controller is a convenient platform for tracking and haptics, and it gives you the freedom to interact spatially with the virtual environment. So if we look at a typical VR controller, here I'm showing the, the Oculus Quest. These controllers generally rely on optical tracking. And that means they need line of sight from the object to be tracked to a camera. Now, on the Oculus Quest device, um, because of the control, most of the controller is actually occluded by your hand, they have this LED ring that extends outside your hand to maintain line of sight to the camera. And these LED rings are tracked by four cameras embedded in the headset. Now, this makes for some really cool experiences, but these kind of devices haven't really expanded past games that we play in our living rooms. We should be able to do so much more with our computing devices than just these games. And one challenge for this is mobility. The use of these bulky tracking rings can't, means you can't just stick this controller in your pocket and take it around with you. The use of multiple tracking cameras around your head in order to maximize the field of view also limits the power and usability of these systems. And so today we see this gap between mobile AR VR controllers and what I like to call living room AR VR controllers. Mobile devices have this great form factor, but they generally only track 3DOF three degrees of freedom, meaning they only track the orientation of the controller, not the position. Contrast that with the higher end living room grade systems, we have six stop tracking, but that comes at a cost. And that cost is we often have infrastructure that we have to place in the environment. We're not robust to occlusions. And it's not really a compelling mobile form factor. So the goal of our work today is to enable the precise tracking that we see in six stop controller tracking systems in the form factor, mobility, and convenience that we see in mobile AR VR controllers. So to that end, this is the Aura tracking system. It uses inside out electromagnetic tracking to track the six stop position and rotation of a small handheld controller that completely fits within the palm of your hand. At a very high level, a transmitter on the headset generates an electric field, uh, an electromagnetic field around the body. And then sensors within the controller measure that magnetic field and estimate the position and orientation relative to the head. So to describe our system in terms of some of the, the goals I've just been talking about, the R system, the controller fits completely within the palm of your hand, so it's a convenient form factor. And it eliminates the need for externally visible elements or line of sight to a, con to a camera. This means that the controller will work with traditionally challenging poses with your hands at your side, underneath the table, or behind your back. Finally, one of the big advantages of our system is the use of arbitrary transmitter coils placed in the headset. Traditional electromagnetic systems have these bulky transmitters. We have a new design and a new algorithm that enables you to customize the form factor of the transmitters to fit the mold of the, whatever h &D system you're designing for. So I, I classify this as an inside-out tracking system, and I want to unpack what that means a little bit. So an inside-out tracker uses sensors on the device to measure the relative transform between the head and the world and between the head and the controller. Now, I'll contrast that with an outside-in tracking system, which places sensors in the environment, which track the head and the controller from the point of view of the world. Now, Aura focuses on one aspect of this problem, the head controller transform. And if you want to interact with objects, arbitrary objects in the world, you generally need both the head world transform and the head controller transform. And Aura is designed to be used either with or without some other tracking system for head world transform. If you have a high-end system, perhaps a, just a single camera placed on the headset, you might have this head world transform, and then you can interact with arbitrary objects in the environment. But let's say you're designing for a low-end system that only uses inertial head tracking. And for that, even with the RS system and inertial head tracking, you could still interact with ob objects placed around your body. For example, a virtual keyboard might kind of follow you around, and you could still interact with that and see your hands at the correct visual location, even without world space head tracking. So I'll be talking about electromagnetic tracking a little bit today, and I want to do a quick um, kind of review just so we're on the same page in terms of the physics. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about different kinds of coils today. And electromagnetic sy tracking systems use two different kinds of coils. First, there's a generator coil or a transmitter coil. 
This is what we place on the headset. And when you place a, when you put a current, an oscillating current through a magnetic, through a wire coil, it generates a magnetic field in a direction orthogonal to the plane of that coil. And when we have a sensor coil, often a much smaller coil, placed within an oscillating magnetic field, this um, change in flux to that coil generates a voltage that we can measure in, this, in the coil itself. So you can see here, when we place a sensor coil perfectly aligned with the magnetic field, um, let's say this magnetic field is a sinusoidal magnetic field oscillating at a particular frequency, we get a sinusoidal signal that we measure in the voltage of the coil. As we turn that coil in a direction orthogonal to the magnetic field, so we have little flux going through that coil, we get no signal going through the, the sensor coil. And so we're looking at the, the relative magnitude of this um, signal in the coil, we can start to estimate the position and orientation of the coil with respect to the transmitter. Now with a single transmitter and a single coil, we can't really do much. So electromagnetic tracking systems often use three transmitters and, and three receivers. So if we look at what some other uh, researchers have done to advance electromagnetic tracking, we see examples from the, the academic community to improve efficiency and tracking algorithms. Examples from industry, folks like Magic Leap focus on inter um, implementing this into mixed reality devices. And also scientific instruments like Paul Hemus, which focus on high precision tracking for arbitrary objects. So what's stopping you from just taking one of these existing transmitters, sticking it on the headset and calling it a day? Well, fundamentally, the architecture of an EM tracking system, electromagnetic tracking system, really just isn't optimized for wearable use. So if we look at existing systems, the transmitters are fairly large. I mentioned that we often have three transmitters in a tracking system, and these transmitters are generally orthogonal, which means you have three different coils kind of placed orthogonally, which results in some kind of cube or sphere shape that's roughly a few centimeters across. So I circle these here. Notice none of these are really compatible with a head-mounted display. They'd be much too large. So what we want to do with the RS system is eliminate the need for um, orthogonal coils or even particular coil shapes to make it more compatible with a head-mounted display. A head-mounted display also contains various metallic objects with the display, various other objects in the, in the headset, and that can distort the magnetic field. So magnetic trackers are generally, the transmitter are generally placed far away from any other metallic objects um, in order to minimize distortions. Well, we want to embrace these distortions and say we, we'll put the transmitter directly on the headset and automatically account for any of these distortions. And then finally, EM trackers generally use lots of power. All of the examples I show here use at least a watt of power. Um, we want to target something that's much more compatible for a mobile form factor, targeting under 50 milliwatts. So let's dig into the RS system. Um, again, it consists of a transmitter placed on the headset and a receiver coil placed in the controller. So if we look inside, um, we first have a custom-made PCB in the transmitter that generates the magnetic field signals and transmits them to the, the coils. We have three different coils. Again, these are kind of molded to fit the design of a headset. This headset is the, the Samsung Gear VR. We didn't do any, um, well, you'll notice that the transmitter coils, they're not round, they're not even orthogonal, um, which is very different from a typical EM tracking system. And we designed this not to be optimal from any tracking point of view, but really just to fit the, the contours of the head-mounted display. But what's important here is that each of these coils generates a unique magnetic field, here labeled M1, M2, and M3, and that field kind of emanates around the body. And then in the controller, we have another custom PCB with a sensor, a uh, three-axis sensor on it that measures these magnetic fields. And the goal here is to estimate the pose of the controller with respect to the headset. So looking at the system architecture in a little more detail, on, on the transmitter, we have a, um, a low-power solution that generates a 100 kilohertz sine wave and then bandpass filters that to generate a nice um, sine wave without any harmonics, and then time multiplexes that through each of the three transmit coils. On the receiver, we have an um, off-the-shelf three-axis sensor that receives these um, magnetic fields, amplifies and filters them, and uses a low-power um, diode-based rectification technique, which can then be sampled by an ADC. So let's look at the signal that we measure in one of our receiver coils. Again, we have three of them. This is just the X component of that signal. We have these three different um, periods corresponding to the time multiplex signal from transmit coil one, two, and three. And then we have an off period for synchronization. And we repeat this every 11 milliseconds, which gives us an update rate of about 90 hertz. Um, and then we have a three axis receiver coil. So we have uh, X, Y, and Z components of that field. So if we look at just one frame of data, we have these nine different points um, that we're using in order to estimate pose. Now, because we're time multiplexing, these signals aren't measured at exactly the same point in time. Um, so we do a little bit of a trick to, to um, resample this data. What we do is we have data coming in at three milliseconds apart. The next frame comes in in the next three milliseconds, and then uh, 11 milliseconds later, the next frame. 
So we do is we basically just interpolate between these frames and hallucinate what the samples would be if we had sampled at a um, synchronous point in time. So just to make this a little bit more concrete, here's a, just a video showing some of the raw signals. I have the transmitter placed on a table here and just moving the controller around in various positions. And you can see the, the nine different raw signals changing on the headset. And so ideally, we take these um, nine different measurements and we have a tracking algorithm that we use in order to estimate the sixth off pose of the controller. Um, but before we can do that, we need to calibrate our sensor. And ideally, in, in an ideal world, our sensor would measure exactly what the, uh, we would see something like this. So the x-axis shows the magnetic field strength, the y-axis shows what we would expect to measure in the coil. Ideally, we would see something linear here. When we actually measure this in practice, we, we have a very linear region, but, and, with low magnitude magnetic fields, we actually have this nonlinear region. So we kind of went back to first principles and thought, what are all of the different things that could go into, um, that could affect these measurements? So we modeled things like the gain of the different um, coils and amplifiers, forward voltage drops due to the diodes, white noise, differences between channel gains. And we constructed this analytical model um, that takes in all these factors into account, but at the end of the day expresses what we would measure in our sensor as a function of the magnetic field strength. And then we have to learn these factors like bias, gain, and noise. So we use a nonlinear optimization technique to, to learn these values, and then we can simply invert this function and get the raw magnetic field values back. So to, to validate this, um, we built what's called a Helmholtz coil. This is a device that um, uses two parallel coils, and it generates this uniform magnetic field. So this red region between the coils is a, is a, re a volume of space where the magnetic field does not really change in magnitude or direction. So what we do is we place the, our controller within the space and move it all around, rotate it. I mean, what we would expect is that the magnitude of the values that we measure in this space um, wouldn't change. They'd be unit magnitude. So we would expect something like this over time. Um, before we applied our calibration, we measured something like this. So it was obvious that we needed some form of calibration here. And after learning these gain, bias, and noise terms, um, we achieved something that was um, fairly uniform. So after applying this calibration, we now have um, three different magnetic field vectors measured from the point of view of the controller. So three vectors in controller space. And we separate the task of position estimation and orientation estimation into to two different tasks. So for position estimation, we first extract um, six different rotation invariant features. These are features like the magnitude of each field and the angle between various um, different fields. So you can see some simulated values here just to give you kind of a sense of what some of these features look like as a function of the cross-sectional space. And then we then train a neural network model. This is not a, a deep learning model or anything. This is really just kind of a, a function approximator in order to regress from these features um, to an estimate of position as a, as a three vector. And then for orientation, we have a separate neural network that regresses from the position um, to the expected values of these magnetic fields in, in headspace. So this is basically just a forward model of the magnetic field that accounts for all of the distortions in the head, um, head mounted display. So now we have uh, magnetic fields in the controller space, in the transmitter space, and we simply use SVD in order to estimate the most likely orientation that explains that. So to train these models and evaluate it, we, we kind of built up this data collection platform. So we needed a, a source of data that was more accurate than the system we were trying to test. So we used a, a 10 camera Vicon system, it's an optical mocap system, um, and we placed these optical retroreflective markers all around the, the headset and the controller. And then we had a user simply kind of wear the headset and then move the controller all around their body, exercising all possible degrees of freedom of their controller. And we collected synchronous um, samples of both the sensor data and the, the mocap data. And I, I want to point out one challenge here um, because it, it's kind of interesting. The, the mocap system samples at 240 hertz. I mentioned earlier our system is about 90 hertz. Um, and we need to synchronize these data streams, which is a fairly simple interpolation task. Um, but actually, the precision here is actually very important. We're targeting this kind of millimeter level error. Um, and if we were just one frame off, and if we're moving at about one meter per second, that corresponds to a, a already one centimeter of error. So it's really important that we get this kind of subframe alignment between these two data streams. Um, so we do um, this process to do this alignment. We take two different estimates of the distance between the controller and the headset. So with the Vicom system, we, it's very easy to do. We simply just measure that distance. Um, with the magnetic system, with the R system, what we do is we take the, the inverse sum of squares of all the magnetic field data, which we found correlates very nicely with the distance from the headset. We then simply take the cross-correlation, sliding cross-correlation over time, um, and use this filtered signal in order to reinterpolate and align our data. 
So as a first order approximation of how, how well we can, we can do this tracking, we first started with a very simple 2D tracking task. We placed the controller, um, the headset on table, the controller on the table, and simply moved it all around. Um, on this tracking test, we're about 1.5 millimeter median error. I um, mean, you can see some example traces here on the, on the left side of the screen. The, the blue line here shows the, the ground truth measured from the optical tracking system. And then the, the orange lines show um, the RR tracking performance. Um, but we're not really interested in 2D tracking, so we, we then moved on to a full six-stop tracking task. Again, this is done with a user who was uh, moving the controller all around their body. Um, you can see sample traces here in X, Y, and Z. Um, notice, the, again, the blue here is the ground truth performance. Orange is the estimated performance. Um, the dashed line is a, is a filtered estimate. So we're about 5.5 millimeters overall Euclidean error. Um, that breaks down with um, slightly better performance in X than Y and Z. So I want to show you a video showing um, kind of some of these results here. Um, and before I play it, let me just tell you a little bit what you're going to see. This is rendered in a virtual environment from the user's point of view. So imagine you're wearing a headset and moving the controller around. On the left side of the screen, the blue shows our system. The right, the right side, the red screen, shows the ground truth system. And what we're going to do here is compare the traces between these two tracking systems. Um, and the camera is moving around just to show you different views. And you can see where the headset was um, on the right side of the screen now. So the, the graphs before kind of give you the quantitative estimate of, of measure of how accurate we are here. But this is kind of useful just to get a general sense of what it means to, to do this kind of tracking. I want to point out one failure case here that will show up in a second um, just to um, be completely transparent about the performance of our system. Right up here, um, you'll notice the, the tracker kind of blips out a little bit. Um, and this is re really just because the, the neural network models that we're using fundamentally are interpolators rather than extrapolators. So it's fairly dependent on the, the kind of calibration data we collect. So thinking more about how we collect this calibration data is one area for future work. Um, but I mentioned earlier that our architecture is really optimized for low power. So I want to quantify that a little bit. Um, we've experimented with different kinds of coil windings and shapes on the transmitter. Um, we can do anywhere from 30 milliwatts to about 230 milliwatts on the headset. And on the controller itself, we're about 45 milliwatts, um, not including any kind of BLE functions or anything. If we compare that to existing tracking systems, um, most of these are significantly more than one watt of power. The Lighthouse systems, for example, use five watts of power. Um, most of the Polhemus kind of high precision magnetic tracking systems are several watts of power as well. So I want to take a minute and, and talk about a few areas of future direction for anyone who might be interested in exploring this space. Um, for our system in particular, um, one thing that we don't have right now is an IMU on board the device. For any kind of production grade system, you would, you would stick an IMU on there and do this kind of electromagnetic IMU fusion in order to get the, the robust, accurate measurements at this 90 hertz rate, um, but then this kind of relative motion at a much higher speed. I mentioned earlier that um, we wanted, we're thinking more about ways to, to ro make our data collection more robust, so thinking more about how we more uniformly collect data um, without having to be subject to these areas where we are missing a bit of data and we, we have poor performance. Um, another interesting aspect would be dynamic transmit power. So when we're moving our controllers around, sometimes we're further from the headset, sometimes we're closer. When we're closer, we don't actually need to transmit with as much power. So we can think about ways to, to save additional power by kind of dynamically um, turning that down when we don't need it. And then in the long term, I think as a field, there are a few directions we should think about, um, particularly around dynamic calibration. So uh, in, in a high-end VR system, we're probably going to have an optical camera um, facing outward as well for head tracking. Um, there will be times when the camera can see parts of the controller, probably not the full controller to do full six-stop estimation, but some form um, partial estimate of that. So we can use this, these partial estimates in order to, to calibrate and account for different interferences that may happen um, in the magnetic field. And finally, um, we should think more about design tools to optimize these coil placements. The design I showed today is really optimized for the ergonomics of a particular head-mounted display, but there are lots of things we could think about in order to optimize the performance um, characteristics as well. So to wrap up, I showed a, um, a data-driven approach that kind of widens the design space for these electromagnetic tracking systems and allows you to design them into a head-mounted display. I showed a low-power architecture, architecture that's suitable for mobile use. And fundamentally, what we're providing today is an inside-out tracking system that gives you the capabilities of a, a higher-end system in the form factor of a mobile VR controller. I want to thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to take any questions.